Well, I don't know where we left off. So I'm Mark. I work for Credit Counseling. We're a charity. You ever need help, you can call us. <laughs> and the thing is, the reason we do these presentations is our mandate is to educate. And we educate because we don't see, everyone says, you know, you just see poor people come in all the time, Mark. It's, it's crazy. Why would you go do this job making a third of what you used to make? But the people that come through our door are generally people like any of us in this room. They're people who have been doing a great, great thing. They've been living their life. They bought houses. They drive cars. They have kids. Yeah, they run up some debt sometimes, but they pay them off. They file their taxes. And then something major happens in their life and puts them off course. So the reason why we talk to people is because we want them to prepare. So if they lose a job, they have savings. And the way you get savings is you budget and you scrimp and save. And we tell a lot of people it's really, really easy to change our small habits. It's really, really hard to change your mortgage payment. So with that in mind, what we're going to talk about today are some ways to save on utilities, the ways we communicate, which is becoming a bigger and bigger portion of our budgets. We'll talk about food because this is a big part of our budget that we have direct control of. Another thing we say is anything that goes in your mouth or makes you smile is something you don't have to do. And as a 300 pound man, I can tell you I'm slowly trying to work that philosophy. <laughs> we'll not look briefly at transportation, but transportation is a tricky thing because if you live in Calgary and can take the C train, maybe you can cut back. If you live way in the middle of the country, maybe you can't. It's hard to hitch. Entertainment, personal, and gifts and special occasions. And by the end, I want you to say, these are three money-saving tips I can apply to my own life. You can look at your own spending and say, you know, I'm getting value from where my money goes. And that's where you'll identify your cost savings. So first off, let's quickly talk about electricity. We've had light bulbs for 100 years now. And they used to be a little hot element that glowed bright and then burnt out. And then we had these CFLs. Does anyone know what a CFL light bulb is? They're curly cues, compact fluorescents, loaded with mercury, not very good for you if you ever drop one. In fact, I dropped one in a Home Depot once, and they had to bring the hazmat team out to clean it up because they're really, really weird about it. But that's okay because you have to be safe. But those are going by the wayside as well. We're now on to LED bulbs. And when these have a, a rebate going from the government, they cost about a dollar each, which is more expensive than traditional bulbs, more expensive than the CFL bulbs, but they have a profound benefit. The first thing is they use up to 75% less energy. The other thing is they last a long time. Anyone know how long? Two years. Keep going. Two years or more. Keep going. Five. Keep going. Ten. About 20 years. <laughs> so I was looking at my refrigerator bulb. It's supposed to go about 1,500 hours because I burned out my refrigerator bulb the other day and it is an old incandescent. You can't use compact fluorescent because it won't glow. Um, and then I looked at the new LED bulbs I just bought for my ceiling, 20,000 hours, 1,500 versus 20,000 hours of life. It's a huge difference. So they do cost a little bit more, but over time, this will save you money. It's not a bad way to go. The other thing we like to talk about are Energy Star appliances. Does anyone here ever go and buy an appliance? Not very often is my guess. And that's a good thing. We don't want to be turning them out. But when we look at Energy Star appliances, it gives us an idea if there's a particular cycle or setting you can use that will reduce the energy consumption. And to be Energy Star, it means you have to have gone and got certification that shows you can save money. The other thing you can look at is the EnerGuide label. And if you ever go into a big trail appliance store or a Home Depot, a Lowe's, wherever you shop, I was going to say Sears, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> and you look at all the fridges lined up. You know, a lot of people buy fridges based on aesthetics. They want the ones that are a little square, or you know, side by side versus the top mount. But when they're all lined up, you can actually see a little sticker on it that will tell you how much energy consumption each fridge uses. And it's probably not your primary motivation in buying this particular appliance, but it's probably one you should consider. Now, fridges are substantially more energy saving than they used to be. They used to cost about $120 a year to run. Now they only cost about 60. But we see more and more people who have more than one fridge. I have a nice Maytag fridge upstairs in my kitchen, a side-by-side. -side. I have a $5,000 Gen Air fridge for my beer in the basement. <coughs> the key in having a fridge run efficiently is to keep it full. It's really, really hard to keep air cold in a fridge because it wants to get out to where it's warm. So maybe fill it up with bottles of water, things that will stay cold for a long period of time, and it'll help keep your fridge cool and run less. Dryers. Anything that creates heat uses a lot of energy. And when I was a little boy, my mom used to hang our clothes out by the swimming pool 
to dry, which was really embarrassing when the girls would come over to swim. She didn't seem to care, though, that my underwear was floating around. And understand, I'm smaller than I was then, and I'm pretty big now, so. Um, but it's not a bad thing to do. Again, don't overdry your clothes. It's really hard on the fabric. And beyond that, why not run it a little bit on the eco sensor? And this will leave your clothes just slightly damp, which is better for the material. But when you pull them out and shake them, they dry completely anyways. Don't shove big, heavy things in the dryer because they don't dry anyways. Hang them up to dry. Clean out your lint tray. If your lint tray is blocked, you lose your airflow. And I'd encourage you once a year to actually clean out the duct that leads all the humid air to the outside because it can be a fire hazard one, but it fills up with lint and constricts the airflow. And the last part on electricity that I have here is to unplug unused chargers and electronics. I think we all have smartphones or things that we plug into the wall. Those things cost about $100 US a year to run, even when we're not charging from them, because they will still draw power. So if we go away for a weekend, turn the power off, turn off the power bars. I have one switch that I can hit in my basement and shut it all off, because the kids will leave stuff running anyways. Anyone have any ideas around saving money on electricity? Okay, well, let's talk about heating. And the first thing we encourage people to do when they are heating their house is to set up equal payments on their monthly bill just because it's easier to manage. My heating bill last month was $400, which was high, but it was pretty cold. But in the summertime, my heating bill goes substantially down to about $25, my gas bill. So it's easier for me to plan out if I stagger it and make it level throughout the year. And most energy companies are doing that now. The other thing you can do is install a programmable thermostat. Let's have the heat on when it's warm or when we need it to be warm. Let's turn it down when we're not in the house. If we're at work for eight or 10 hours, turn it down. The dogs don't care if it's a bit cool. They have big furry coats, right? You do <laughs> save a substantial sum by reducing your thermostat by two to five degrees over the course of the day. Airtight windows. I live in an old 1950s bungalow. You can stand outside and feel the air seep out the old windows in my house. Weather stripping would work fantastic or new windows would work well too. You can get those argon loaded windows where it keeps the heat out in the summer and the heat in in the winter. Sort of an insulation. Turn your water heater down. Do you really need scalding water for your shower in the morning? People do ask me about water heaters. If I'm going away for the weekend, should I turn it down? And my general thought is if you're just going away for two or three days, it doesn't save you much money because you have to heat that big whack of water back up. And that takes a lot of energy. But when we go away in the summer for two weeks, we do turn it all the way down because no one's going to be using it anyways. And we feel we save a little bit of money that way. You will see people also use um, insulated blankets around their water heaters or around their pipes. It's a good idea too. And right here is uh, window coverings, using them strategically. In New Mexico, when they built their houses way a long time ago, what they do is they'd set the windows to catch the light in the winter so the house would warm up. But in the summer, when it, the sun was higher in the sky, the sun would bounce off sort of the stucco and not go into the house to try and keep them cool. Now, we can't necessarily do the same thing because we mostly live in boxes and the windows are flat and not on an angle. But you can dry your drapes to keep the sun out in the summer or pull it in in the winter, right? Any other ideas around heating? You could wear a sweater. Utilities, water is a big thing here. We live in sort of a, a semi-desert climate um, and to two flush toilets are, are pretty popular. I'm not gonna explain exactly how they work for you. I'm gonna leave that to your imagination. But one button is for one thing, two buttons is for another. If you use the right button, you're saving upwards of three liters of water on a flush. And water is a massive problem. Did you guys hear in Calgary a couple of months ago how these people got water bills for $2,400? A little bit strange, right? And the city said, I think it was NMAX who said, you know what? Your toilet was running. Well, that's like running a fire hose. I don't know how much water you, your, your toilet runs, but that's a lot of water. So I don't know what happened there, but what I'd encourage you all to do is to check and make sure your toilets aren't running. And to do that, you just drop a couple of drops of blue food dye, always blue because it implies cleanliness. I used to sell toilet pucks. I know this. That's why they're not red, they're blue. And just watch and see if your toilet water in the bowl turns blue. If it does, your toilet's running. 
because water shouldn't leave the tank to the bowl unless you flush, in which case it's probably worth investing in a new toilet or repairing it. Quite often in the springtime, there are government rebates when you buy new energy efficient toilets, so it might be something to consider as we get into the season. And they're pretty easy to install. I can do it, and I'm useless. <laughs> Limit watering your lawn. I watered my lawn last year because my grass was like sticks. I could not stand walking on it. I was missing the fact I wasn't mowing it, so I got a soaker hose and I turned it on for three days. My water bill was $400. I was unhappy, and I blamed the children because <laughs> they took a shower and it was more than five minutes. But really, you have to be really, really careful because water is very expensive and it's always getting more expensive. We do live in a dry climate. So really limit how much you're watering your lawn. If you know you live in a dry climate, why not plant plants that are good for the climate? Um, I have these giant cedars in my front yard. Whoever bought the, made, built the house put these cedars in 50 years ago. Cedars do really well on the West Coast. <laughs> They're brown in my yard. Doesn't matter what I do with them. We should plant things that work in our climate. And the last thing here was we have dishwasher, and this can be laundry too. We should only run full loads of laundry, full loads of dishes. The dishwasher doesn't know how many dishes are in there. If we have one fork, one spoon, and a cup, it's still going to run 10 liters of water on the cycle. Beyond that, it makes the water very hot and burns a lot of energy in terms of heat. I'll also ask you, because almost everyone likes to heat dry their dishes. Do you guys do that? You shouldn't. The dishes don't care. They really don't. And you're just, running, you're just creating heat again, which is very, very energy intensive. There's probably times when you want to, but ask yourself, do I really need to? I usually just grab the Tupperware and shake it and throw it in the drawer because the kids use it for their lunch and it's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about TV and internet. This is a big area of, of angst in my house because I got rid of the cable. Now, do you guys still have cable? Nobody has cable? <gasps> well, my wife likes to watch sports, and I don't. And I got rid of it. So it's really, really hard for her to watch sports. But I'm comfortable with that. It's more together time. But she didn't want to get rid of the cable. And the problem I have is we have Netflix. Does anyone have Netflix? I just listened to the report come out on the news about how many subscribers Netflix has. Apparently, we all have it. It has a huge amount of content. Beyond that, because we order on Amazon, we have an Amazon Prime. There's a huge amount of content on there. Sometimes it's good to have cable if you're big into sports, but other than that, there's a lot of alternatives out there. One of my wife's big concerns was that we wouldn't have TV news if we didn't have cable TV, but that's not true because you can get a digital antenna for $20 from Best Buy or wherever you buy digital antennas, Walmart maybe. Plug it into your TV and you'll still get the local channels. So you catch the local news. Work? <laughs> I tried. I, you know what I did when I got rid of my cable? I cut the cable line outside and I tied it directly into the digital antenna and hammered it on the outside of my house. I got three channels. I got Global, I got CBC, and I got Vision TV. That's all we need. The kids are burning their brains out on YouTube anyways. So one thing, some people will shut off their TV seasonally. I have a place in Palm Springs. The TV's on when we're down there. And for eight months of the year, we shut it off because why would we pay for cable for no one to watch? In terms of internet, some providers charge you by how much you use. And I know my mom had internet in Ontario and that's what they did. They were always charging her for the extra amount she used over above the base rate. So be careful, make sure you have the right size package determine if it's the right speed for you. I don't use the internet much. I'm okay if it's very slow because it slows the kids down. My mom doesn't really use it. She doesn't need it at all. She's afraid of it. So we got rid of it. Bundling stuff sometimes works. Um, consider selling the TV. I wouldn't do that. It took me 30 years to get a TV, you know, 40 inches or bigger. I do know that some people will run Android programs off Kodi boxes and watch TV because you can download YouTube and watch a whole bunch of other stuff off them. If you're a big YouTube or, or other content watcher, knock yourself out. A Kodi box is about 115 bucks. Just plugs into the back of your TV and works with a remote. Or you get Roku or what have you. Communications, this is a big cost. Mobile phones are the bane of so many people's existence when they sit down with us. Well, my phone broke, so I got on a new contract and got another phone. 
Well, that's not a good idea. How many phones do you need? If you broke the first one, you're just going to break the second one. I'd encourage you to think if you have a mobile phone, do you still need a landline? Another bone of contention. My wife did not want to use the landline. She said, well, what happens, you know, if the zombies come? The cell phones won't work anymore. And I think to myself, well, if the zombies come, who are you calling anyways? But will the landlines work either? When they had that big earthquake in Haiti, it was the cell phones that still work, not the landlines. So if you have both, ask yourself why. And some people with kids who aren't yet on cell phones will keep a landline. It's convenient. Other people who make calls you know, to, to different parts of the world might find it less expensive. But many of us just use it locally. Do you need it? Do you have the right plan if you are on a mobile phone? Some people pay upwards of $300 a month for their data and the other things they use. They have the most high-tech phone going. That can be good, but can you not use Wi-Fi? And every time you, 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 your phone is up for renewal, do you have to get a new cell phone? I had the biggest cell phone on the market. It was about seven inches big. I loved that. It lasted me almost two and a half years before it fell apart. I didn't want to get a new phone. What's wrong with the old one? I, can't, I can barely text. And I challenge most people on how many movies they're making on their iPhones. Do you need the technology? If you do want to shop, you can shop at cellphones.ca. There are some great deals. I'm on Freedom Mobile. It works for me. I've been with them for a long time. Um, but it doesn't work probably in Strathmore. I don't think you guys are in the coverage area. TELUS has a discount carrier that you can find online. And it's substantially less expensive. And what we usually find is the big three are more expensive than the discount carriers you can search elsewhere. And often they're somehow related. They use the same cell towers. Anyone have any ideas about cell phones or other types of modern communication? You probably know more about it than I do. No. All right. Well, let's talk about food. So what do you guys spend on food per person every month in your household? Well, that's a fair statement. Give me an idea. I'll tell you what Health Canada suggests. $100 a person? No, probably higher, right? $200 a person? A week? Is that what you said? Uh, per person per month. So if you're four people and you spend, I don't know, $1,200, it would be $300 per person. Right? We spend more than the average. So Health Canada says the average person is about $250 a month for food and toiletries, groceries and toiletries. And when my wife grocery shops, she actually spends close to $1,500 a month for our family of four. And it sounds like a ginormous number, but it doesn't really seem that way. You don't see us eating a lot of steak. We're kind of a hamburger family. But I always ask people to sort of rationalize it out and figure out how you can bring that cost down. Because for a family of four, that's probably our second single biggest expense after the house. And that's where we can make a big impact. So one of the things we do is we create a meal plan. And the whole idea, because my son is going to be a very, very big boy. His grandmother was 6'3", he's going to be a giant. You can already see it. <laughs> he's 12, he wears size 9 shoes. And we know that he will eat anything you put in his lunch. So when we make dinner, we always hide a little bit away from him and stick it in his lunch the next day. We do meal planning. And the whole idea is by making meal plans, we can set up a very, very limited shopping list and buy everything we want that's a good deal in the week, pretty much. And the whole thing is, when we have a grocery list and we're dedicated to sticking to it, it helps us avoid that impulse shopping. And I'm not very good at this because I always seem to start at the bakery section. And I have something of a sweet tooth for these donuts they make at Safeway. So you'll often see me walking around eating a donut, and I do pay for it. I say, yeah, there was a donut. Okay. And if you're not careful, you'll see me eating a sandwich from the deli at the end. But when we have a list, we can help avoid some of that stuff. Because it takes us right where we want to be, and it lets us shop just that section. If we're looking for beans, we're not shopping for spaghetti sauce. We encourage people to focus on raw fruit and raw vegetables. Because A, it's a healthy choice. But what we find is when people cut it up, and I find this in my house, if we cut up carrot sticks and put them in the fridge, my boy will reach for carrot sticks instead of cookies. Because they're right there in front of them, they're bright. We also encourage people to be very, very careful in not overbuying produce. 
When I was at Whirlpool, I think the number that came out was that the average family of four threw away $2,000 a year in produce. It's a lot of money. And part of that is, is that people don't put the right produce together. If you put ethylene producing produce in with non-ethylene producing produce, it rots. And I'd have you think about your grocery store and where do they put the bananas? What's beside them? You have to think for a minute, right? Nothing. Because they rot other fruit. And it's the same thing. Avocados will do it as well. Apples will do it as well. It'll ruin your peaches. So you can go to Tupperware. You can Google search Tupperware, um, ethylene producing fruits, and it will give you lists of what should go together. And that might save you a few bucks. But one idea is to buy fresh produce for the start of the week. And then at the end of the week, yeah, eat some frozen beans. And there's nothing wrong with frozen food. I was eating frozen pineapple today. It's picked at the best time. It's just frozen. It tastes good. Let's use leftovers. Let's plan big meals. If we're cooking a roast, let's make sandwiches out of it. I bought, after Easter, the biggest ham you've ever seen for $9. They were just trying to get rid of hams. We had ham every day of the week, and no one liked it anymore. <laughs> and we threw some out because no one was eating any more ham. We had it with eggs. We made sandwiches. We made creamed ham. Have any of you had creamed food lately? Went out in the 60s, I think. That's when, my, that's when I think I last saw it. But it's okay to buy big things and make them work, especially high quality things. And the last one is give gardening a chance. I don't know if you guys garden at all. Does it save you money? What do you grow? Uh, everything. Tomatoes, zucchini, steak squash, lettuce, spinach. My friend Ken took a go at it this year. And I love Ken. We go away together and do stuff with the kids. It's the two dads and the kids. And he decided he was going to grow some stuff this year. So he's like, I don't know what's going on. I got the weirdest looking pumpkin growing. So anyways, he brings it over and goes, here, it's a pumpkin. I don't eat pumpkin. It's, look at it. It's disgusting. It's all warty. And I said, Ken, that's not a pumpkin. That's a squash. <laughs> anyways, he didn't know what to do with it. So we ate it. And it was good. So it was free to me and I liked it. But the other thing we did in our house is we bought this ugly, poorly pruned apple tree 20 years ago and planted it in our yard. And every year, I swear, it gives us a thousand apples. And everyone in the neighborhood gets apple something as we try and burn through it. It keeps us social, but it's really, really cheap. We've had hundreds of dollars of apples. So if you like to garden, it's not bad. In terms of food shopping, we can also use rebate apps. Does anyone use a rebate app? How does it work? You do a lot of stuff. Here, you do the course. <laughs> Yeah, that could be one of the ways. Well, you, really, what you usually do is that you go to, let's say, Checkout 51, and it's going to say Craft Dinner is a rebate item. When you buy a box of Craft Dinner, we're going to give you a quarter. You take a picture of your receipt, you take a picture of the UPC code and send it off to them, and they collect the money. And they send you a check. And people tell me they get hundreds of dollars back on these rebate apps. Now, I don't work my cell phone, so I don't do this, but I think this might be one way I could save some money. What I do use is Flip. And I love Flip, which is a price matching app. When you use Flip, you can pull up all the grocery flyers at once. So you can be walking down Sobeys looking at the Walmart flyer. And that's a great thing because almost all the large grocery stores will price match any of the other ones. They're all very competitive. And I've done it where I've said, hey, this car looks cheaper over there. Price match it. I want my dime. And they will do it. And some people will do it right at the checkout for you. And other people will make you go to customer service and get it done. But it's your money embedded in theirs. And it doesn't only work on groceries. It also works on gifts. Because I bought something at Canadian Tire, this great Lego set, Star Wars Lego for my son. But I got $10 off because I showed them the Walmart app where it was cheaper. It's worth doing. And again, it's just an app you put on your phone. Manufacturer's coupons. When I was with WD-40, we loved it when people would cash in the 75 cent rebate on our 2000 flushes toilet pucks. Because toilet pucks aren't a very relevant area to category managers at grocery stores. They don't really care. It's a low-end product and they just sort of move through. But every time they saw that people were cashing them in, we were sending checks back, they got excited because they knew this was a product that would sell. And in fact, if you called us and asked us for some coupons, we would just mail them to you. And you might find a toucan there as well or something that was branded. I tell a lot of people, if you really like Pampers diapers and you're having kids, 
Call Procter & Gamble and ask them for coupons. See if they won't give them to you. And the last part is shop with cash. Because food is such a big part of our budget, and because we're always so tempted by the nice things in the grocery store, it's best not to go and shop on credit because we can overspend easily. And even a debit card, we can spend extra money on a debit card and not really feel the pain until we have to put the money somewhere else. If you're on a tight budget, having $200 in your wallet will keep you spending $200 because even if it's $210 at the cashier, you'll just have to put something back. So cash is king. Eating out. Oh, this is a sad part of my life. <laughs> One, well, my dad was an executive, and we lived a nice life in Toronto. But they were both post-war post -war kids from the Second World War. My mom used to wear her brother's boots to school because they had no money in England. And though my dad was this executive, we never ate out. Once every two weeks, he'd either say, we're going to Swiss Chalet, which was a big deal, or we're getting pizza. That was it. That's kind of how it was. He was pretty tight with us that way. What I see when I sit down and do budgets with people is they, they eat out three times a day. They get up in the morning, they get coffee and a breakfast sandwich. They pick up lunch. Maybe they go for lunch with the girls or something at work. And then they grab a coffee in the afternoon. And it's not a terrible thing to do, but it's very, very expensive. And it's definitely a departure from where most of us have come from. And I think we have to sort of get back into our heads that going out should be a treat and not just something to be expected. So maybe limit how much we go out. And maybe we're just going to cut back slowly and stop giving up one, start giving up one coffee every day. Or maybe we're only going to go out for lunch twice a week. But just work it back a little bit because, again, it's a big savings. When we go out, do we have to get coffee at the end of the meal? Four bucks for a cup of coffee at High Steakhouse is an expensive coffee, and it's not even like a frappa thing. It's just coffee. Desserts are expensive, too, and so are appetizers. My wife and I are great. We split an appetizer and we split a dessert. And she eats the whole dessert, and I eat most of the appetizer. <laughs> but we both feel like it's balanced out calorie-wise. And sometimes we'll even split plates. And I went for dinner with my friend Leo in Palm Springs, and his wife and my wife, and it was the strangest thing, because me and Leo shared a plate of fried chicken between us. And I'm a 300-pound man, and he's not a small guy. But yes, we're dainty. We're going to share an entree at this expensive restaurant, just because it was hot. So it's OK to share plates, especially if you're getting a lot of other stuff. We should be aware of our calorie intake as well. And my wife has made me aware of my calorie intake lately. And making coffee at home. And coffee at home is getting more expensive too. We should be aware. Does anyone have an espresso machine? No, I got one. It's a buck for every pod I use at home. And it only uses the one type of pod. Keurigs aren't bad, but you can get very expensive Keurig or you can load your own. Pretty cheap. Pots of coffee are still really, really cheap. So watch coffee. This slide just demonstrates the cost of going out. And again, it's not a huge amount of money. It's only $80 a week. And that's going out for a couple of coffees, a couple of lunches, and maybe a couple of dinners. And that's probably just one person. I can go out for dinner and eat 50 bucks at one sitting. So it's 80 bucks a week, 320 a month, but it's almost $4,000 a year for one person. So if it, this is you and your spouse doing the same thing, it's $8,000 a year. It starts to add up. And it's not that it's wrong to do, because maybe this is the best part of your life. You love to eat, and there's a lot of foodies out there. But for $8,000, you could do some pretty cool stuff. I don't know if anyone likes to travel, pay down mortgages, retire one day, but that's a lot of money and it would accumulate. So if you get value from it, it's okay to do it as long as it's not hurting you. But is there more value elsewhere? Transportation? Well, there's lots of options. Does anyone here walk places? Okay. Depends the time of the year. <laughs> <laughs> well, this year I wouldn't want to be walking around too much. I, well, it was. I went down three times, and it was unpleasant. And people laughed at me. <laughs> well, it's pretty funny when you see the big guy drop. It's like, oh. Um, but yeah, it's hard. it's hard in the winter. And the truth is, Alberta's not necessarily the most public transit friendly place in the world. Um, you guys probably have some taxis in town? No? Any? 
<laughs> oh, are they? <laughs> the town shut them down because yeah, they wouldn't get relicensed. Oh, right. They, they wouldn't comply with the licensing. Well, I, I and I think they have problems right now because yes. I mean there's a lot of competition. Do you guys have Uber at all? No. no. I just came back from Vegas. We didn't rent a car. We didn't take a taxi. We Ubered everywhere. Super convenient. Mm -hmm. But that's Vegas. It's not Strathmore. And there's a thousand. Everyone drives Uber down there. I had a teacher. I had a guy who built drones. I had a guy in the military. They all Uber down there. So it's it's just a second job for them. Um, but I, you don't really have that here. In Calgary, it's not such a big thing yet. Becoming a bigger thing. You guys could bike places. Which works sometimes, and you could walk. You have some nice walking paths around here. But in the middle of winter, I agree, it could be hard. And public transportation is great in the big city, but until they run the LRT out here, I don't think it's going to do you a huge amount of good. So we sometimes run a comparison between what cars cost versus public transportation. And when my brother lost his job, he gave up his car and he said it was a thousand bucks a month off the top that he saved. But if you need your car, you need your car. And it's great to save $1,000, but standing on the roadside, hitching, doesn't necessarily do you a lot of good. What I do sometimes encourage people to do, though, is consider, do you need two cars in the family? Really, me and my wife, she could take the train to work if she wanted to. She doesn't want to. But other than that, she makes me go everywhere with her. Do we need another car? She's not carrying stuff from Costco. She <laughs> married me to do the carrying. So it's one thing you could do, and if you can reduce your use of car, it's better. Anyone see how much gas jumped today? Yeah. Upwards of 140 a liter. That's a bit crazy. When we do buy cars, let's consider what do we really need, though. Did you know you can buy an F-150, a 150, for $98,000? Because someone came in and told me that's what they paid. They were paying almost $1,400 a month in a monthly payment on the car. Never mind that the gas was another $1,200. It's easy to get carried away, and dealerships are funny places because, of course, you know, when I go to the Chevy dealership, it's not a Chevy in the middle of the floor. It's a Cadillac. They're trying to make me buy things. That's unusual. If we're going to buy cars, let's buy what we can afford. If we want something fancier, is it wrong to buy a used car? You could buy something that's got a really big label on it, an Infiniti, a couple of years old, probably for the same you could buy my Chevy for. Brand new. If that's one of the things that gets you going, it's a good way to save some money. When you drive a car off a lot, it's worth 20% less 200 meters down the road. It's immediate depreciation. And cars last a long time. My neighbor, Bernie, he's got three pickup trucks in his yard, all of which are 40 years old. Hasn't changed the muffler on any of them. <laughs> Let's remember maintenance. Fancier cars require more expensive maintenance. And when you buy new cars, that maintenance has to be done by a warranty tech. I change my oil on my 10-year-old car. If I do it wrong, well, the car's worthless anyways. If I do it on my wife's new car and the engine falls out, they're not giving me a new engine. They're saying it was my fault because I turned the screw the wrong way. So be aware. Also be aware of premium fuel, especially now that we're in the land of turbo. Most turbo vehicles require premium fuel. If your regular gas is 140, your premium's got to be 160, 170 a liter. It's a lot of money. My wife drives virtually the same car I do with a turbo instead of a six-cylinder engine. Her tank is $80 to fill. Mine is $55. And I'll just touch on insurance discounts for a minute. Has anyone ever shopped their insurance? That's good. You really, really should. And I noticed last year looking at my statement that while my cars are getting older and worth less and less and less, my insurance kept going up and up and up. And I thought, well, this has got to be a mistake because how can something that's worth less that they'll give me less money for cost me more money to protect? So I called them. And I said, hey, you know, I've been with you for 16 years now. Pretty good customer. I'm confused by this. Can you let me know what's going on? Why is it costing me more? It just does, sir. You have to deal with it. And I said, well, I've been with you a long time. This doesn't seem right. Honestly, the guy, the guy's on the phone with me and he says, if you don't like it, shop it. I thought, whoa! Well, this, if he was face to face with me, he would not have said it in that tone to me. I can guarantee it. So I said, okay, thanks very much. And I hung up and I went to shop it. And I thought, well, I'll call one, one organization. So I called a big name organization that gave me a price. And I said, okay, 
I'm going to shop it again. And I went to a broker. And the nice thing about going to a broker is they don't shop in one insurance company, they shop like 10. And sure enough, the guy goes, I got a great deal with you. Instead of paying $2,200 a month, I got you $1,500 on your cars. I think that's my house too. I said, that sounds great. Who's it with? The same company I was insured with. <laughs> At which point I said, you know what? I'm going to the other place I shopped because for $8 more a month, I would rather give them the business. I learned an important lesson. We should shop our insurance. We should shop things we pay for on a regular basis. And in the modern age where everything's a subscription, you know, Spotify a subscription, Sirius Radio a subscription, cell phones are a subscription. Are we really doing our due diligence around them? I do now, because I was really, really mad. <laughs> Entertainment. I have no idea what you guys do for fun. This is a huge area that people spend money on, and it can be quite troublesome, because people really like to have fun. They really like to do bad things. So we include tobacco in there, because that's sort of a, a distraction. You know, you go to work for a cigarette in the middle of the day to amuse yourself. And we encourage people to track these expenses. Because the truth is, we don't always internalize what we spend on the things we enjoy. And I had a gentleman. He sat in my office, and I knew he was a smoker because he had like yellow fingers, and he, he was a smoker. I knew, you could smell it. And we're doing his budget. I said, well, what do you spend on rent? $800 a month. What do you spend on groceries? $400 a month. What do you, how much do you smoke? And right there, he gives me three packs a day. He doesn't give me a number. It's three packs a day. I said, Okay. Congratulations, you're very committed. That's great. <laughs> what does that cost you? About $100 a month. And I thought, well, that's unusual, because I know a pack of cigarettes usually runs about $15 per. So that means one pack of cigarettes over the course of a month is about $350, $450, right? So three packs should be like $1,400. Well, that's unusual. But I knew, because I've done this for a long time, I could tell him that no, your number's wrong, there's something not right. But I didn't, I said, oh great. Well, you're $1,000 overspent on your budget, this is the problem, you need to make some changes. And I sent him out to track three areas of his, of his life. I said, you gotta track your groceries, you gotta track your eating out, and you should track your tobacco. So sure enough, a month later comes along, and he goes, Mark, I gotta tell you, I smoke too much. <laughs> and I said, I know, because you're spending $1,500, not $100 a month on cigarettes. If you smoke two packs a day, less, Still smoking a pack a day. Good, ho good hobby, hobby. He would have had enough money to balance his budget. He'd stop building up debt. But he, when we have these things that we really like to do, whether it's comic books or eating out or smoking, we have to come to that on our own. And that's why we have to track the expenses and really take a close look at what we're spending. And there's lots of great ways to track expenses. You can do it on a piece of paper and a pencil, right? Just write it down as you spend the money. You can get an app like Mint, and if you go to the Play Store or the Apple Store, Mint will read into your credit cards and your debit cards and tell you exactly what you spend at different parts of your life. So much at gas stations, so much at convenience stores. If you're a smoker, you know what you buy at convenience stores. Cigarettes, maybe a pack of gum once in a while. It's worth tracking. We see our habits, and this is where we can get control to better impact our lives. Sometimes we're our own worst enemies. We can sign up for rewards programs. Do you guys have a big movie theater in town? <laughs> I, I, did, I didn't see the giant like megaplex. A lot of people have seen points in Calgary, so they get free movies, which is great, except when a bag of popcorn and a pop costs you $30, they're still getting their money from you. I sent my daughter to the movie the other day. I said, here's $40. She's like, that's not enough. I was like, well, what do you mean? The popcorn, the popcorn and the drink were $30. It's like, oh, I see why I don't go to movies anymore. I can't afford to when you go. But reward points can be good things. Anyone do any reward points of any sort? Air miles? Aeroplan? WestJet reward points on the credit card, maybe? Yeah. It's good. And so long as you're not building up debt doing it, these are things that can contribute to your happiness, right? It's great to use points to buy things. When air miles was a big thing, I spent 800 air miles to buy my sister a first generation iPad. Favorite gift ever, still uses it six or eight years later. I don't see a lot of stuff on air miles anymore for me. I've moved to a different plan. Go to movies on cheap nights. 
I don't know if that's a big factor for you. Tuesdays used to be cheap nights in town. Matinees are less expensive than daytime movie, than uh, evening movies now or weekend movies. Libraries are a great place to go. And they're actually becoming a great big hub again. It's strange because they almost seem to lose relevance at one point. And I hate to say it because they're good places. But with the modern age, you think, well, people are just getting e-books to read and stuff. Well, that's not what people do at libraries. They come here and look for jobs. They get movies. They socialize. They get their comic books. That's where I get my comic books. They're wonderful places. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money to do stuff. Instead of feeding all your friends when they come over or buying them wine, they could bring their own wine. My friend and Sheila always bring over a bottle of wine when they come over for drinks on a Friday night. Sadly, they drink like two and a half. I encourage them to bring more. Board games are coming back. Dungeons and Dragons has had a big resurgence since Stranger Things came on the Netflix. It's a fun way to spend an evening with the kids. We played Romoli the other night with the kids for the first time, which is a card game. Deal websites. Groupon is fantastic. Have you guys ever tried Groupon? I did Vegas on Groupon entirely, except for Cirque du Soleil. And the best thing we did was this Nathan Burton magic show on Groupon for $10. Everyone liked it the best of all the things we did. We did indoor parachuting. We went to the All Day Arcade. We went to the Marvel Museum. We did the Cirque. The $10 show off Groupon was the one that was the hit. And it worked. there's Groupons everywhere for anything you want to do. Laser tag, it's there. You want to go to a restaurant, it's there. You want to go get a massage, it's there. Car maintenance, oh, it's on Groupon. It's worth hunting the deals. Long walks are nice, especially if you have someone to walk with, but not so much in the winter. And of course, you can still listen to the radio instead of listening to a streaming service that you have to pay for. Um, or you can chase things down on YouTube. Has anyone ever gone down a rabbit hole on the internet? Has anyone not? I went to discover Garth Brooks because I got tickets to his concert in Edmonton. I lost eight hours of my life going through old songs that I hadn't heard in years. <laughs> People do it with Reddit. They start reading an article and there's a link. Oh, well, I'll look at the link. Oh, there's another link. All of a sudden it's 4 a.m. in the morning you haven't gone to bed. Personal goes into clothing as well. And you all look like a really well-dressed group. I'm going to assume that there's some boutiques in town here that you tend to go to. Fantastic. Not everything has to be new, though. And I told you, my mom came from post-war Europe. My dad had money. He was an executive. But we all wore used clothes all the time. I wore my sister's winter jacket. I was not very popular. She shopped for us at the thrift store. And some of the clothes, they were like from decades gone by. But it's what she did because that's where she came from. And I sort of took a little bit from that. And I love the thrift stores. I spend all sorts of time in them. I get all my comic books. I bought shoes there. I bought this great pair of Bostonians, size 13s. You can tell if they're used because they'll be really run down on the edges. Brand new. I think they took them off some dead guy in a casket and sold them. Fantastic. <laughs> but I do this with my daughter too because my daughter has very, very nice taste. She really likes Lululemon. It's just a big brand of athletic apparel. I tried to go into the store once, and the guy said, sorry, sir, there'll be nothing in here for you. And I said, thank you very much. <laughs> it was quite hurtful. I'm buying something for my daughter. Oh, I guess you can come in. Super. But if she wants something from Lululemon that costs 50 bucks for a shirt, she has to cut back somewhere else. She has a budget she has to live in. She goes and buys her jeans at, at the Value Village, and she's comfortable with that. And you have to shop well. You know, you have to check the holes for pockets. If the zippers don't work, you've not got a deal. Because it's really hard to replace zippers. Unless you sew, I guess. So it's okay to get some consignment stuff. When the kids were small, we used to trade stuff around with other people all the time. My kids were big. People in our same group would take their old clothes. Because they wore them for like two weeks, and then they were out of them. When we're buying things, though, it's nice to be super fashionable. But timeless looks go forever. And I think the ladies know about those little black cocktail dresses that you just wear again and again to different events. Most guys will have a tie that they wear. And it just goes with them for a long time. Mine are paisley. I have two of them. And of course, you can still use reward portals to shop if you want to save some money. Ebates will let you save money on all sorts of things. And you can buy a lot of neat stuff on Air Mile and other 
type of collector points if you need to save a couple of bucks. Gym memberships. I can tell you all work out. How many gym memberships do you have? I had one lady in my office that had three. She had one at work, she had one near her house, and she had one in between. And the reason she had one in between was because she moved, but she did not know how to cancel it. And worse yet, I asked her, because, you know, people get quite personal with me. I said, so how often do you go to the gym? Oh, I don't go at all. <laughs> it's like, well, that's a lot of money not to go to the gym. Gyms can be great things. I spent my time in them. I used to run. Believe it or not, I could run, I could run 10 miles in an hour at one point, looking like this. And then I stopped because I could do it, and why would you keep doing it? I didn't get these people who kept running. And there could be a big social thing as well, because I know people get together and go to the gym, and they make you feel good, and they make you look good. But if you're not going, don't pay for them. Look for something that brings you happiness and gives you exercise. Could you play squash or racquetball? Maybe you'd rather swim. It's not wrong to put money at, at fitness. It's wrong to put money someplace and not use it. So if we're going to put the money there, let's make sure it's going to someplace we're going to use. It'll encourage us to get to the lifestyle we want. In terms of used equipment, my boy, who's 12 now, he has a Bowflex. A Bowflex brand new is $1,500. If you go on Kijiji, so long as you're willing to go pick it up and carry it out of the basement, they're completely free. Because people have bought them, notice that they take up about 12 square feet and say, I want it out, after they've not used it for a year. After the first baby, my wife got a treadmill. And I said, I'm never going to use that at home, honey. I'll go to the gym. I'm never going to use No, we need a treadmill. Twice it got used. And then it was a clothes rack. And you hear that story all the time. Oh, I don't know what I did there. You hear that story all the time. But it was completely true. That's what we did. I'm just going to fix this. And the biggest problem I had is I couldn't get rid of it because no one wanted to carry it upstairs with me. And finally this guy came to get some old mattresses I had and I said, you know what buddy, it weighs a thousand pounds. If you'll take this treadmill today, I'll carry it up for you. And I did. And yeah, he took it, but no one was paying for it. Free equipment's great equipment. But there's other things you can do. Go do a, go, go run out in the outside. Go do those CrossFit things where you're flipping tires in, in the yard. Pick up a kettlebell for 20 bucks. It's great exercise. Does your employer sponsor these programs? My wife works for an oil company. She doesn't have to get a gym membership with her health club membership. She can go sailing or buy golf clubs or do great things. Is that something you could tap into? I work for a charity. We can't. Lots of people like to travel. Anyone gone anywhere good lately? Where? Where'd you go? Have you gone someplace good lately? India. It sounds hot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, it's, it's cool. I went to Vegas. We go to Palm Springs. But people seem to like to travel, right? And some people like to do adventure traveling. Some people like to do resort traveling. There's good ways to travel and bad ways to travel. If you can travel off-season, you save a boatload of money. Airfares can be half as much. Discount carriers. Swoop, when they were selling their first chunk of tickets, were only charging you the tax. They were giving you the seat for free. When I was a salesman, I had a $99 limit on any hotel room I could, I could stay in. That was my limit. I couldn't go over it. And if I went into Fernie and I, I went into the hotel and I'd say, how much is the room? 120 bucks a night. I'd turn around and look sad. Oh, what's wrong, sir? Don't you want a room? I don't have that much. I can't spend that much. Well, what's, how much can you spend? $89. My limit was 99. He'd say, okay, we got a room for you. And then I'd have 10 extra dollars at the bar. <laughs> but if they don't rent the rooms, they don't get any money. If you're going in there, they'll often negotiate the rate. And when I worked for the one company, we weren't paid on our sales volumes. We were paid on profitability. We all stayed in terrible hotel rooms and drove subcompact rental cars. You learn how to make a buck when you're a salesman. Lots of good websites you can go to. Um, if you want to find better deals, you don't necessarily have to go where you think you're going. You could just shop Mexico. I like to shop Red Tag. And you can just choose Mexico as a whole. This, you know, I don't really care if it's Cancun or Mazatlan. I just want someplace hot with cold drinks. 
So sometimes being flexible on your location will help you find a deal. And a staycation is a great thing to do. We went away this March, but the March before, we decided we'd stay home with the kids. My wife had to work anyways. So one day, one of the fun activities we did, we were going to go to the movies, but we woke up and the kids were fighting before breakfast. So a fun activity was to walk from Chinook Mall, where I live, all the way downtown and then go back. And they weren't fighting anymore at the end of the day because they'd had such a good time. There's tons of stuff to do in the city. We could have gone to movies, could have done mini golf, could have done laser tag. We went for a giant four and a half hour walk. Personal stuff like around children can be super expensive. I don't know if you've all had kids, but they tap me dry. Everything you do with them costs money. We're doing a birthday party for my son. He wanted to do laser tag. It's $250 just to play two games of laser tag. We grouped on it, a group on it for $150 for 12 kids. Much better deal. But we'll do cake and pizza at home because we're not ordering it from their special restaurant where they charge you $15 for a bad pizza. And the truth is kids don't really care so much what you do. They, they want some things, but most of the time they just want to run around and tear about and do their own thing anyways. So we have to be careful that we're not implying the things we want on them. Big fanciness, you know, center of attention. Kids just want to play. In terms of other things you can do, you can get season's passes to a lot of activities for kids. We live near Heritage Park, so we get a season's pass to Heritage Park. But when we got that season's pass, we were dedicated to just using that park. We weren't going to Callaway Park, we weren't going to the zoo, because we didn't want to throw extra money at extra activities. The next year, maybe we'll do Callaway Park, or we might do the zoo, and we'll just switch it around. And we will bleed and bleed and bleed that season's pass for as much happiness as we can, because they're very expensive. Some kids will be entertained by a hose and a sprinkler. My kids, both being double digits, will be entertained by painting the fence when school lets out this year. <laughs> I will pay them slightly to do this, but I think it's okay that they sometimes earn the other activities they get to do. My son wants to do goalie camp, which is crazy expensive. The fence needs to be painted. Sometimes having them do the things they don't like to do can be as entertaining for them as it can be for you. And there are lots of birthday rewards. On your birthday, if you go to Marble Slab Company, they will give you free ice cream. My friend Ken, he will go to every Denny's in town and get his moons over my hammy in the one day. <laughs> he loves it. He loves the deal. So there are lots of birthday rewards too. In terms of Christmas and special occasions, this taps people out. And there was a recent study that came out that said 51% of all Canadians are stressed out about having to give gifts to the rest of their family because they can't afford it. And most of us are just like our families. Like, I have a twin brother. His life sort of mirrors mine to some extent. So if he's stressed out, I'm probably stressed out and vice versa. One of the things we used to do is we'd draw names, which worked well. Except someone in my family always bought terrible cheap gifts, even though there was a firm limit that you had to buy between. You only need so many cordless phones in the era of cell phones. <laughs> and then what we decided to do was that we draw names just for kids. But the kids all have so much stuff anyways that we were just piling on extra gifts. So we decided not to do that. Now we don't buy gifts for anyone. We just send season's greetings with cards. Funniest card wins. When you have family that lives outside of town, though, it's expensive to ship. I bought my mom because my mom I still love. I bought her this 1912 iron train at the Goodwill. Cast iron, great condition. I stuck it in a box, it cost me $40 for this train. I said, she's gonna love this under her Christmas tree, it's gonna lighten up her day. $68 to ship. It wasn't quite the deal I thought it was when I bought it. And it broke in shipping too. So it will need to be welded. But let's be careful around postage, and not just the postage, but all the other things. The gift wrapping, right? Super expensive. Um, the little extras you add into things. You know, if you buy someone a big screen TV, that's great. But how about the HDMI cords, um, you know, the insurance, the power bar? You know, you can actually double up on the extras that go into gifts. We have to be really, really aware of what we're buying. And often with me and my wife, we don't buy each other anything anymore because we've been together 20 some odd years. I'm 44. Um, we just buy time together. 
And that's what we'll do. And part of our big holiday thing is making pierogi together. And I don't like making pierogi, but she really does it. Well, she really watches me do it because I roll out the dough and I stuff them. She boils the potatoes. But that's kind of a special evening we do at Christmas. And it's a lot big thing with our friends. We go over for the same open house every year with our neighbors. And we just sit and we have a drink and we laugh. And there's make your own gift certificates. These don't always work because they don't always want what you're giving them. My daughter made some where she would be quiet if we had presented the certificate. Apparently it didn't work. So there's a ton of tips in here. The truth is there are 75 tips in this whole presentation. What do you guys want to share? What do you do to save money? If you need help, you can call us. You can find more information at mymoneycoach.ca. You can get budgeting, tracking, information tools. If you need a quick question, you can call our 1-800 number. Someone will pick up and answer a question for you. They'll probably put you through to a counselor. That was my favorite part of the job, just answering questions. You can have a free one-on-one -on -one appointment once, twice, three times, whatever you need. No one gets paid a commission or anything. What I will, though, is I'll flip it around, though, because doing this job, what I've discovered is that people are really bad at asking for help. And the longer you wait, the fewer options you have. And we still see people from the High River Flood that come and see us, you know, five, six years later saying, yeah, things got bad. It's like, well, why didn't you come and see us three years ago before things got really bad? So if you know someone that needs help, start a conversation. And if we're not the people to send them to, 211, we'll pick up, that, that's the city of Calgary, city of Edmonton, most big cities and most small villages. It's the, the city or community United Way joint hotline, and they'll refer you to a resource where you can get help. But if you can start the conversation with them, they will seek the help they need. So that's just how I like to end. Cool. All right, well, thanks for coming, everyone.